or in anticipating the interview because for many of you, if you've been listening to the show, particularly earlier in the year, if you remember, I had an interview scheduled with Dr. William Pepper. And Dr. William Pepper has written several books now, a couple of books on the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and that didn't come off because we had some difficulties in the student studio that day. And I was supposed to get reschedule the Dr. Pepper, and that could not happen at the moment. But what they did was they gave me a rebroadcast of another interview. And during that interview, Dr. Pepper mentioned Isaac's name. And I said, oh, okay, so let me get in touch with Isaac and see if he's willing to do the show. And sure enough, he agreed to do the show, and we scheduled for this morning, and he is here. So Isaac Newton Farris, Jr., nephew of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and attended his uncle's alma mater, Morehouse College, where he majored in political science. Mr. Farris's background has given him a unique perspective and real-life experience on some of the most pressing issues of our times. Growing up in one of America's most socially and politically active families has provided him with a front row seat witnessing how policy is formulated and implemented. Mr. Farris has met and dialogued with countless heads of state, CEOs, religious leaders, academic leaders, and grassroots activists. In addition, he has also participated in debates and commentaries for print, radio, and television media outlets ranging from CNN, USA Today, to WSB Radio. In 1984, Mr. Farris got his first hands-on experience as a political operative when he served as Georgia Field Coordinator for the Walter Mondale presidential campaign. A year later, he served as Deputy manager for the re-election of Andrew Young as mayor of Atlanta. In 1986, he was campaign manager for Martin Luther King III in his successful bid to become a Fulton County Commissioner. From 1987 and 1992, he served in executive level positions in government where he was responsible for implementing policy. In 1992, to 96, Mr. Farris was tapped to become president and CEO of the Clean Air Industries Incorporated, a company who was not only involved in environmental cleanup, but also developed a patent technology which allowed combustion engines of trucks, buses, and cars to run on clean, burning, natural methane gas. In 1996, Mr. Farris was appointed Chief Operating Officer of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center, and in 2005, he was appointed President and CEO of the King Center and served in that capacity until March 2010. In August 2011, Mr. Farris was elected President and CEO of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Mr. Farris currently serves as Senior Fellow of the King Center, where he continues to write, research, and lecture on life philosophy and the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. And I welcome him right now to the Reading Circle microphones. Isaac, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Thank nice you. Thank you so much for joining. And I tell you, for me, it is an absolute honor because like I said, I don't think probably like many others, I don't think I've studied any other family as much as I've studied yours. And uh -oh. particularly you know, because of, of your uncle, but because of the contribution your your family has made to the world, you know, your grandfather and grandmother and all the way down the line to your cousins and yourself, and you all just keep on pushing. So I don't think I've studied any other family as much as I've studied yours. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you on the show. I want to do a few things. I want to talk about life as uh, Dr. King's nephew, one. Um, and then talk about and move on into current events of what's going on, because I'm reading your blog and I see you definitely stay up with the politics and you comment on that. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about that throughout the time we're together as well. So, I mean, I looked at we're, we're a couple of months apart. Matter of fact, we're almost almost. Let's see. You're April 1962, April 13th, correct? Sure. Yes. And I am August 17th, 1962. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So we're almost yeah. like, well, this is so it's April, May, June, July. We're almost about, almost exactly four months apart. <laughs> 62 was a great year. Well. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's right. Yes, it is. A great year is right. And so when I read that, I said, wow. So we were about the same age when your uncle was assassinated. And oddly enough, I mean, this is one of those things where people say they can always remember where they were when something big like that happened. Like people that were around when JFK was assassinated, when your uncle was assassinated, Robert, all, that, all those people could tell you where they were. 
And even though I was only five going on six at the time, I remember what happened where it was whenever the news came across that your uncle had been killed. And I remember how my mother and father reacted. And I remember going into the bathroom and getting into the bathtub for some reason. I don't know why I did that. But I remember going into the bathroom, locking myself in the bathroom and just sitting in the tub crying. Um, and I remember it. And even though I'm like 54 years old now, I still remember it at that time because it was such devastating news. And I probably didn't even know what was going on, but I just probably picked up on the reaction of my parents. Yeah. So and I, I somewhere I was reading about you and, and it was saying uh, you were saying, well, to us, he was just Uncle Martin, the fun uncle that came around. So <laughs> talk a little bit about what was that like and what has it been like? Because even as we go through, you say, you know, that's Martin Luther King's nephew. What is that like? Yeah, well, um, probably like you, the only thing that I do remember about Dr. King, what was the day that uh, he, he was assassinated? Um, I remember Uncle Emil, right? Uh, and I, I I put it like that because I I was not really old enough to probably well I wasn't old enough to really understand the work that he was doing, um, but I had vivid memories of him as an uncle, as a human being, uh, playing with him, uh, being with him at, at family gatherings. But I I didn't I was not aware of of the struggle that was going on. Uh, around at the time, and that that's one of the um, one thing I guess in life if if I could change if I could just be a little older um, because I would have had the opportunity to to um, not only know him as Uncle and Mill but to know him as dr king and 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 probably work with him um, because our family has always you know been close like that and and we've always worked together. Exactly. And that maintained throughout. I mean, that's historically, whenever you read about your grandfather and your grandmother and your uncles and your aunts, or, historically, that's what always came through is how close-knit you all were. Uh, even when Martin was young and your mom was young and so forth and so on, that came shining through in every book I've ever read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no doubt about it. And I, I think that's one of the things that, that enabled him to be uh, to have the strength that, that he had um, in reality um, and, and, and also spiritually. But it, it's certainly no mistake that um, he wound up back uh, in Atlanta after uh, the, the Mon his first Montgomery, the Montgomery campaign, um, because Atlanta gave him, through my grandfather, uh, won the political cover, uh, that he needed, um, you know, because of my grandfather's political connection, right. very close with with the political leadership here in Atlanta. Um, you know, and particularly uh, he and the chief of police, the sheriff, were very close, um, and uh, that that was very helpful to my uncle. But also, um, he, he gave my uncle a job, uh, right. so faster. Uh, of Ebenezer, which allowed him to um, take care of his family, but also uh, freed him financially um, to, to fight the fight. Um, so clearly, there was always that, that connection there on, on a number of levels. But in terms of, of uh, being his nephew um, and knowing Uncle Emil, um, it certainly was, he was a fun guy to know. Um, as I got older and um, became aware of Dr. King right. um, and, and his work, um, it certainly became uh, both, um, you know, uh, a responsibility and, 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 a, and an honor as well, but certainly uh, a responsibility not only just being his nephew, but, but that's something that's just really been ingrained, uh, you know, from the family. Right. Uh, you mentioned my grandfather, but there was also a great grandfather. Right. That's uh, correct. A. D. Williams. That's right. And uh, you know, it's interesting. Someone asked me a couple of years back. There was a, there's a school, elementary school here, named for for him. And someone asked me a, a few years back, "Hey, why did they name that school after your great grandfather? Was that because of your uncle?" Um, 
and uh, <laughs> you know, I I, I I I politely said to the person, "Well, think about what you just asked." <laughs> and they named the school after my great grandfather, right? You know, because based on my uncle, um, <laughs> and uh, I was saying, "Hey, no, 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 not at all." Uh, they named the school after my great grandfather because um, he led the fight right. in Atlanta to make the uh, school board build the first black high school for for for, for blacks. Um, he also was was the first uh, president of the NAACP here, right, uh, in Atlanta. So, it, um, and then he he was the, the the pastor of the church before my grandfather was. So. Uh, there's always been a strand of of both, you know, religious social activism uh, in my family. Um, you know, aside from from the uh, the work that my my uncle did, and actually part of that, uh, you know, was a kind of a natural progression. Correct. Of, um, of what my family was doing. I mean, my grandfather, for instance, Martin Luther King Sr., you know, back in the 30s, um, led a march on Atlanta City Hall. That's correct. Um, much like that, much like, you know, a small, that was a smaller version of the march on Washington, except uh, it was a lot more dangerous for my grandfather. Right. Uh, personally, to his life. Right. Uh, to do that uh, than, than what even what my uncle did in D.C. I mean, you know, um, the federal government was not going to, at least that day, not going to kill my uncle um, for, for, for leading that march. Uh, but for a black man in the South, uh, especially one of the capitals of the South, to march on a, you know. You know, you're absolutely right. That. Because, see, that's the thing. As I said, I've read about everything that you've just spoke about. I've and, and, and I'm thrilled to be talking to someone who's who who can attest to it live. Like, in other words, it's one thing to see it in a book. It's nothing to talk to somebody that's recounting the events that's a family member. So sure. everything that you've said, I've read about. And that's what fascinates me the most because your family, like some other families during that time frame, were some of the more well-to-do african-american families or at least families who were not afraid to speak up i mean because a lot of african-americans at that time because of the times they went along to get along because they were not they did not want to get killed they didn't want anything to happen to them. but your family stood up in spite of that and it just as you said it progressed it did it did and and you know not to to cast any dispersions i mean atlanta is you know proudly claims my uncle uh now but quite frankly you know when my uncle came back here right um, you know, there were not a lot, it, you know, there were not, you know, a lot of people just saying, hey, come back here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were a lot of people that appreciated the work that he was doing, don't get me wrong, but the attitude was, we're doing okay here in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, anybody, don't rock the boat, you know, right? rocking the boat. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I mean, and, and Atlanta probably was one of your better examples in the country of separate but equal I right. mean, blacks here did have their own kind of world, um, and and they really didn't feel like they were missing a lot, um, you know, being segregated. Um, but it was still wrong nonetheless. But but bottom line, so they were like, hey, you know, we're doing okay here, so, you know, <laughs> we don't need you really coming in here upsetting the apple cart. Um and that's one of the reasons why he never really did until the like the last, maybe really the last year of his life. He never participated in any uh, demonstrations in Atlanta. Wow. Um, you, you, you know because he he took it upon himself. I mean, my grandfather certainly did not ask him to do that. Right. Um, but I think he felt like he didn't want to make things awkward and it would not have uh my grandfather was a very <laughs> a very very secure man right oh um, i've read the book daddy king yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but my 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 uncle was a very loving and loyal son and i i think he felt like knowing knowing that you know the the 
the, the preachers, the black ministers of my grandfather's era, uh, and even some of the younger ones, you know, like I said, really were not that enthused about him, you know, moving back to Atlanta and, and what that might mean. So I think he always kind of felt like, you know, I, I'll just, you know, kind of look at this as neutral ground here and, and impact stuff indirectly as opposed to directly right. engaging in any demonstrations within the city of Atlanta. That is, that is, I, and it's, it's weird because as I followed, as I followed Dr. King's story, um, it is amazing the parallels biblically. And if you look in there where Jesus goes back home and they all start like questioning his authority, like, well, who is this? Aren't you the carpenter's son? Wasn't you? Right. It, it's kind of like, who are you to be? And that's right. when he says, you know, a prophet is without honor everywhere except in his own home. That's and, right. And as right. I'm listening to you, that's what's coming to my mind. It's like, I'm all over the world, but I come back to Atlanta. It's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's that same deal. But, um, Again, I, I, I've read many of the books, and, and I remember some of the scenarios and the stories where, like, with your grandfather, with the shoe store, where, you know, they couldn't come through the front door if they wanted to buy shoes. They'd go to the back, and your grandfather's like, no, we're going through the front door. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. I mean, and, and like I said, which is why it was is really kind of amazing, but I guess, you know, times are, and maybe even we can make some of the parallels now. Um, with um, with what's happening, say with 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 Black Lives Matter, but, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's just interesting. My, my grandfather and and during his time, and and, and my great grandfather, they were very active. Yes. Um, and so, for my uncle to be, you know, kind of told to, you know, kind of put the brakes on, was, was kind of interesting. But but like I said, that there's, I guess we can make some of those parallels. To, to what's happening uh, today with 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 how 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 protesting happened back in the doing the movement versus how it's happening now. You know, see, that's what I said. That's when I said at the top of the show. We're gonna we're gonna work our way in terms because I'm excited and thrilled to be talking to an actual family member. Because I'm telling you, your uncle and your family, they're like when I talk about my heroes, I'm talking about my heroes, and I know I'm not the only one like this. So you probably hear it all the time. But when I say my hero, let's put it this way: I pledged Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity because of your uncle. Ah. Uh. Because okay. I happened to be reading one day, and I saw where he was a member of Alpha. And I tell people all the time, so let me be clear with you. <laughs> had Martin yeah. Luther King Jr. been a Kappa, I'd have been a Kappa. Had he been a Q, I'd have been a Q. Had he been a... <laughs> had he, when I came across, I said, that sold it for me. If that was the fraternity that, that Martin was in, that's the fraternity I'm going to be in. But, I mean, it's to that that level. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, Mark, just for your, your... I know you know this, but just for your listeners uh, who might not be aware of it, I mean, we... We, we certainly would have to um, give credit to the Alphas for the, the King Memorial. The oh, King oh King. yes. Uh, um, uh, today, I mean, it, it, was, it was their idea to, to, to make that happen, and uh, the Alpha stuck with that through the years, and uh, the, the, the nation and the world has them to think. To, to yes, think. I have one of the... When we first came up with the idea we saw these marble bricks and i gotta think i think my number is 091 or something like that but i have one of the first bricks when we were doing our first fundraiser to try to get because we started within the alpha house in terms with the brothers like okay uh you know we want you to support the cause and 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 i have this marble brick and and then as we got closer to the end, whenever the monument was being built, I got all kinds of little stuff. I got a piece of the granite that the statue is made out of. I have plaques and pictures of it because I constantly was sending money and supporting it. But uh, again, it's just I think the contribution to the I, I'm really like in awe, and I'm not I'm not one to get starstruck, but it's not a matter of just entertainment value. These are things that change the world. Of the reason that like, your family and other families. They stood up and were able to speak out and protest and fight against. It's the reason why we're able to do what we do now. I tell people, I'm the prin- when I'm not doing radio, I'm the principal of a school. And I tell people all the time, if it wasn't for people like that, I would not be sitting in this principal seat right now. Sure. I mean, so that's why I'm always eternally and, and grateful. I'm grateful to God that he put people down here to do the business of that. And I'm grateful for the people who did it. Uh, the first time I came down to the King Center and I walked 
out there. It was like around, it was around, I was visiting a friend and when we were going to leave that Monday or later on that day or something. So we went down to the tomb at about six o'clock in the morning. And I'm telling you, Isaac, when I got down, I had the weirdest feeling when I, I mean, it was like a surreal feeling because that was my first time. I've been down there many times since so my mother lives in Georgia. So every time I go to see her in Louisville, I make my way to Atlanta. But the first time I went, when I got on those grounds, it was a surreal experience. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I had a had a, a, a great vision, um, as you know, for, for the listeners who haven't been to the King Center. Um, you know, everything is right there. Right. You know, it's, it's next door to where he preached and grew up in the church, and then a couple of blocks up the street is the birth home. Where Correct. Was, and then in the opposite direction, uh, a few blocks down, is, is, was the former uh, home of uh, headquarters of SCLC where he worked. Correct. And that's why she specifically located uh, the King Center and, and his crypt there. Um, you know, so it's it's a very, for those of you, who have not been to to Atlanta would encourage you to come and, and check it out. It's as Mark will attest. It's I a, second a, that motion. I, I mean, I would not if you anywhere in the anywhere close to the Atlanta vicinity, you have to go to the King Center. You there's no there. Like I said, my mother lives in Louisville, which is about two and a half hours away from Atlanta. And there's not a time I go down there when I don't make my way to Atlanta and I go to the King because it doesn't get old for me. It does every time I go to Met- the first time I was down there, the new Ebenezer wasn't built yet, and then okay. the next time I went down, I think they were in construction, and by the next time I went time, it was done, because you have the new church right across the street from the original sure. church, yeah. and again I walk through there and I see the various artifacts. If you go into the King Center, so I'll go upstairs, you see the various robes and the Bibles and the the jeans and the jackets and everything yeah. is, that they're all showcased. Yeah. It is some. Experience. And the other thing is, see, you said it, and I want to talk a little bit about that before we shift gears. You were saying for you, I didn't know anything about him traveling the world, the movement, Dr. King. All I knew him was that was Uncle ML. Right. And so that was the side that, you know, a lot of people don't, they don't know that side. I mean, the worldwide. I mean, you, are the, the intimate family knows, of course, and, the, and friends and so on. But the fact that that tomb is laid out in public like that even speaks to that. He was, he was the people's person and you yeah like, yeah so that that crypt is not like somewhere off where you, it's on a street when you go it is it auburn street right yes that's right when you go down auburn street that tomb is there and and coretta has been added since her yes. passing yes, uh right. but but it's there ebenezer's there right there on the corner and in between the center and the church lies the tomb that anybody can walk up off the street and be there. But the fact that you have that insight of that, because I know my uncles, I know my mother's brothers and sisters and my father's brother. That's exactly how you say, oh, that's such and such. You know, when I go to his house or her house. So, but that's, that's insights you have. And uh, Dexter and because all of you were small at that time, Dexter and and Bernice. And I know um, Yolanda's gone now as well, but Again, for me, just to, to talk to somebody that was that close, and I have I've, I've talked to what is, what is Reverend Alvita to you? She's my co- she's my cousin. She, as, as a matter of fact, Alvita is the first of of, our, of my generation. Um, she's the, the oldest grandchild. Okay. Um, she is the eldest daughter of my other uncle, who was the youngest of the three kids. That was AD, my mother, right? Uh, A.D., uh, there was my mother, Christine, uh, my uncle, M.L., Martin Luther, right. Jr., and then A.D., Alfred Daniel, right. um, who was actually named after. Your uh, grandfather. But you're the right. Great right. Great so, Alvita is A.D.'s daughter. Right. And yes. The first, she of, of my generation, she was the firstborn, so she would be the oldest uh, of the fourth generation Okay, some years ago I had her on the show as well. I had the opportunity uh, to speak yes, with her. That's I've had I've I've had a couple of family. I've been trying to get I'm trying to get Bernice. We haven't been able to connect yet. <laughs> I'll I'll definitely do my part in, in trying to help that them to make that happen. Well, thank you. I know she she travels the country 
preaching and evangelizing yeah. as well. So I know her schedule is busy. And um, for that, like I said, Dexter, uh, Bernice, you, and it, because the story doesn't get old. And this is where maybe we can kind of shift gears in terms of it's as relevant as it was during that time frame as it's almost like it feels like we're going backwards where we are at the moment. No question. Uh, uh, I mean, this this week... Because I sent you an email and said, okay, based on the events of this week alone, I know we're going to have something to talk about. Because we had this whole thing in Washington, D.C., where the, the gentleman comes through, and now he starts shooting at the congressman. Yeah. Um, you got that going on. You got, it seems like Donald Trump, because I've done commentary on Trump. It's gotten to the point now, it's, like, it's almost like I'm getting bored with it, because every day he gives us something else to give commentary on. But it seems like, to me... I could be wrong. And folks in the listening audience, we know we did the disclaimer. The views and opinions heard here on this show are solely those of the host and guests. Do not represent the studio or the station or the university. But it seems to me personally that Donald Trump, his agenda is trying to do away with everything President Obama did. It just seems like every move he makes is to overturn or to turn back something Obama did. Yeah, uh, are, you, are you are you saying that? Or are you asking me? Or I'm, 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 it's both. I'm taking it as a statement and a question. And I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one seeing it that way. But it just seems like he's on a, a a mission to anything. And and the reason the reason I'm saying it seems like that mission is, and again, it's a theory. I could be off, but it's almost as if to say, I whatever that African American man put in place, I'm going to take it back out of place. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know if if that's necessarily what what the deal is. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know that. First off, that Donald Trump is really that deep. <laughs> now that's a good point. I, <laughs> I, I think he first and foremost is a, a salesman marketer, uh, probably one of the best we've seen in our lifetime. Right. Um, you, you know, but I, I I think that's that's where his his head is. Um, I don't think that he is uh, philosophically th- th- that deep. You know, that's not the excuse or to right. uh, make it. You know, make excuses for some of the things that he's he's done that I don't agree with. But I I don't know that it's necessarily rooted in. Let me try to. Um, you know, undo everything Obama has done. I think it's more rooted in he's figured out that that, that there's some people out there that don't like, right? You know what Obama has done. Yeah, that's um, a good point. And so he he's going to overturn it. Not, but it's not. All I'm saying is I don't know that in his heart he's like I want to overturn. I think he he's a marketer. He's I hope still, you know what Isaac. I hope that's more the case than my assumption or theory because that i and i could totally agree with you on two points the 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 depth piece i would agree you're right he probably hasn't put that much thought into it and secondly you're right he's going to capitalize on the fact that if people didn't like that then i'm going to use that to my advantage yeah and and listen like i said i'm not trying to let him off the hook because in some respects i think that's worse because he knows better right if, if if i'm making any sense i mean I don't, for instance, I don't think that he's a racist. I think he's um, racially ignorant right. on, some, on some things. But I don't think he's a racist. But I, I think maybe, you know, he could be, you could make a case that maybe he's worse than a racist because here again he knows better. You know, um, and so, I, but, but do I think Donald Trump, you know, is walking around thinking, you know, racist things about black people? No, I, I don't. Um, like I said, I think, you know, he, he doesn't know a lot of black people, and so there's some probably right. uh, some maybe even some stereotypes that, that he's probably uh, vulnerable to from ignorance, right. not from, from just racism it's kind of like when he said initially i don't know if you remember doing the campaign um that he thought that um that maybe women should be um maybe uh gone after criminally for having abortion right um he, he you know that was just donald trump being new to to that 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 thinking that type of thinking 
Right. And so he really didn't know. You, you know, all he, all he, here again, the mar, ma, master marketer salesman knows, hey, abortions for, for, for right wingers, you know, right. Are bad. Right. But he, he doesn't really know, so he was a bit ignorant on that. I don't think he would say that today because he, he knows that even though people, even people against abortions aren't talking about putting the women in jail. Right. I mean, he, he knows <laughs> that right. now, but he didn't know that then. All he knew is that, hey, you, you know, uh, these people want laws and stuff against abortion, so they probably want the women to go to jail, too. So he said that. Right. You no, know, just saying stuff, <laughs> telling, telling, telling right. you know, not knowing. So I, I'm saying, you, you know, I think there's a lot of the, the marketing in it. And like I said, I mean, you've got to give credit where credit is due. I don't know if we'll ever see, at least in our lifetime, Mark, somebody who can be elected president and spend maybe about $50 million. That's correct. Doing and, so, and most of that $50 million, he was paying himself to, to right. fly his plane. Because right. you, you, even when you're running for president, even if you own a plane, based on our laws, you've got to rent the plane from yourself. Correct. You, you can't just, you know, hey, I've got a plane, I'll use it. I, I mean, our laws don't allow you to do it. So if you look at his expenditures, most of his expenditures are for that plane, for a few, for the great Make America Great paraphernalia, All right? Again, um, and renting halls, you know, to do his rallies. Correct. Uh, I'm telling you, this guy spent probably, maybe at most, maybe at most, about fifty million dollars. Most of that he spent with himself, and he's president. <laughs> and, um, and beat out 16, 17 other candidates, right. plus the five that were on the Democratic ticket. So That's he, right. So he beat That's out right. close to That's twenty-one right. people. <laughs> right. Now, having said that, it is 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 sad by some of the stuff that he's doing. I mean, even this latest thing with Cuba. Right. You, you know, and here again, I I mean, it, it's there's no vision in a lot of the stuff that he's doing, and and he's he's hurting some of the very people that he. He wants to help. Absolutely uh, right. That's another market for us, Cuba, quite frankly. Absolutely. Now, I'm looking at your blog, The American Citizen. Yes. And that's one that I see. You're gonna, the latest post I see from June 15th is Chuck Schumer. It's the fourth quarter with two minutes to go. Time to bring the heat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, you've talked about, you mentioned about how, you know, um, everybody right now is kind of preoccupied with, you know, this Russia right. collusion and, and all of that. And quite frankly, Mark, that's a long-term proposition Right. That, that's not going to be worked out for months. Uh, first off, to be honest, I don't think, you, you know, if, if, he, if he does get impeached, it'll be like Nixon for stuff he's doing now. Right. Not for stuff he did during the campaign or any of that. I, I just, you, you know, um, I think he did... I, I, I think Russia did what they did, but I don't think, you know, quite frankly, that uh, they changed any votes. Um, the guy, for lo- whether we want to like it or not or admit it or not, I mean, he won. Right. <laughs> That's you know, absolutely kind of right. Fair and square. Um, but, 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 but getting back to your, your point, um, so Democrats are kind of, you know, going down these rabbit holes. Right. Um He's not going to be impeached, Mark. I mean, Republicans aren't going to impeach him because they got a president who can sign their stuff. Correct. And they're not going to mess with that. Um, so you really got to come with, with some serious wrongdoing for them to even think about that. So, And Democrats don't control anything, so they can't make that happen. But Correct. what they can do um, is try to concentrate on stuff that they can make happen. Um and, and health care is one that I, I, I really do think it, it, it'll be hard, but there's still a possibility of saving and repairing Correct. Obamacare. Rather than uh, replacing and repealing, yes, that's yeah, right. So, but, but they need, they've got to step up their game, and I'm saying instead of, you know, focusing so much, I mean, this is an important Peace, but but the stuff isn't the infrastructure is in place now to take care of that, right? So so let this independent council and the media is still going to do this because they they want their ratings. So let them, you know, kind of deal with that. And what he needs to be doing is trying to to figure out how we can bring the heat, how we can bring the pressure, 
um, to, to get people focused like they were before, right. like it, when it was in the House. It's an, easier, it's an easier thing to do now that it's in the Senate because uh, you've got some people that are vulnerable, and all it takes is three senators right. to, 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 to not vote for it, and it won't happen. Um, and then, you know, we're back to something's got to happen, so let's repair Obamacare. But my fear is, is that if they pass something, even if it's not as bad as the House version, um, they would have passed something. So then the next step is then to, 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 to what they call reconcile the two bills. Um, and that puts them on the road to, to repealing Obamacare, quite frankly. Correct. Um, they'll come up with some type of compromise between the two, but the bottom line, both of, both of them are saying they, they're coming out of the box with one thing in common, they're repealing Obamacare. The House version really does it in a draconian way. Uh, the senators probably are going to try to do it, I guess, in a less draconian way if they if they succeed. Um, so then you you'll have to come up with a compromise between the two. But the bottom line, Obamacare would have been repealed. And uh, this is not about trying to save you know Obama, uh, you know Barack Obama's legacy or anything. Uh, you know, right. that would speak for itself. This is about, you, you know, and if we need to call it Trump care, I'm willing to do that. Um, <laughs> as long but, as but you have some health care. You, you, you know, we're on the right track with this thing. Uh, it's not perfect. It's got some flaws. But principally, at the core, we're on the right track. And, and the right track is that, look, you, you know, we're not talking about Rolls Royce care here, but, but you, you know, America... It's a strong enough country that, that, you know, we're in a position where we can say, look, you, you know, there's just a, 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 a minimum layer, uh, a minimum layer of, of coverage that right. we're just going to make sure that all of our citizens get. No, absolutely, because... Okay. I mean, I'm not talking about tummy tuck surgery, right. plastic <laughs> surgery to make you look better and, and stuff like that. that that's... that's Luxury stuff, and That's I'm not correct. talking about that. But I, I'm talking about the basic stuff. That is, and it's so true. I mean, it's because you never, you never know when an illness or something is going to strike, and you've got to have something because the first thing they ask for in the emergency room or at the doctor is your insurance card. That's it. That's the before they even do anything. That's the first thing they ask for. Because I know I was, I was, I, my wife had to go to the emergency room last Sunday because she woke up Saturday morning. Her hand was swollen from something. We had no idea what it was about, so we went to the emergency room Sunday afternoon. First thing they asked for, they start pulling up your records and your charts, and, okay, the insurance company is who? So for those who don't have it, I mean, it, yeah, it, it could be a mess. Yeah, and, but, but the other thing about it is we end up paying anyway because, as you know, you, you know it's against the law if you, if you really are in need of right. it for, for, to be turned away. Correct. Um, in, in an emergency situation, but but there's also no need for, for someone to, you know, through no fault of their own. Uh, we've heard some crazy stuff coming out of the, the out of Capitol Hill in the last. <laughs> right. But you know, uh, we don't. Nobody knows how we get cancer. Right. I mean, specifically, I mean, we we know what well, we know that smoking. We finally figured that out, but but uh, other than lung cancer, we we don't know. There's been maybe some theories about diet and all of that, but nobody knows. So, uh, bottom line, we can't you know blame people for getting sick. Correct. Blame you know there was a one congressman who who tried to imply that that uh, you know Obamacare was unfair because it it. It, it made people who lived a healthy lifestyle have to subsidize people who did not. And right. find that, it, that, that, you know, people who do the right thing don't get sick. And right. The wrong thing do. And that, that's just simply crazy one. Um, and there probably is. I mean, that's one reason why we don't need to be cutting, you know, the funds for, right. for the national uh, health services so they can continue the research. There probably is something. Maybe that we're doing that, that's causing us all to get cancer, but we're not doing it knowingly. Correct. <laughs> I'm saying, who would do that? I, I, I'm saying, come on. 
Um, so, yeah, you, you might be right from the standpoint. There's probably some stuff we're doing. That's why we need to continue to research. That's correct. So don't cut the money so we can figure out, you, you know, how to prevent it. But in the meantime, until we do, you know, one, people need to get adequate treatment, and right. they don't need to go broke right. or corrupt uh, in order to get it. And that's exactly what's happening, because I know my, I tell you, my mother lives down there in Georgia. And when I talk to her, she tells me about how much now, because she's nearing 80. She's about, she'll be 79 this October. Um, and she's back and forth to the doctor. And she's constantly sharing with me about the expense. And, and we're even, my sister and I, even like, we don't even understand why somebody your age should be charged. <laughs> but, exactly. but she's looking, I mean, like medical bills up the wazoo um, at this age. And that's not to cut you off, Mark, but that's one of the principles I was talking about with Obamacare. Because, right. you know, right now, um, even though uh, she's experiencing what she's experiencing, you, you, you just imagine if we didn't have Obamacare. Exactly. Because, you know, what people don't really realize, the, the general lay public, and I'm just saying it, I know you know, but I'm saying it for listeners who out there might not realize it, is that, First off, Obamacare affects us all. Yes. It's not about people who can't afford health care. Yes. Um, and one of the w- w- important ways to the point you're making um, that affects us all is that the Obamacare law says that insurance companies can't charge your mother but for so much more because of she's older. Right. If I'm making any sense. Yes, the, you are. Before Obamacare, it, it used to be that, hey, once you hit a certain age, you know, insurance companies said, hey, we're going to really sock it to you. Because you're a risk. You, 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 right. 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 Um, Obamacare says, no, you can't do that. Um, and part of that is just like anything else, you, you know, it's a risk pool. Right. Right. It, it, right. It's, it's sharing. It's burden sharing. And that's that's. That's the thing, uh, Mark, that, that um, quite frankly, not to, to diverge too far from the subject, but that's why my uncle's teachings uh, are so um, badly needed yes. today and to, to be reminded of the, 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 the beloved community that, that he talked about because what's at the core of this? Um, and the reason why this is so hard for, for some people to embrace um, and that we're getting away from as a society is that beloved community. Right. Um, because really, Obamacare really is, is an example of the beloved community. It's Correct. It, we're going to put everybody together, um, you know, so that we can all kind of carry the burden. So that so these people who are out here complaining about well, I'm 60 years old. Why do I need to pay for prenatal? Why do I need to pay for prenatal care? Uh, in as a part of my insurance right. plan. Well, you need to do that, ma'am or sir, for your daughter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, or for your granddaughter. That's right. Okay. Um, females' bodies are more complex than males. Right. Because uh, they're the ones who. If, you know, who further our civilization, they Correct. carry life within Correct. their bodies. That's a more complex machine. I, I mean, they're like, say, the Apple iMac as opposed to the, you, 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 you right. know, uh, I, or they're the Rolls Royce to, to the VW. Uh, it's a complex machine. Right. Naturally, they need to go to the doctor probably more than yep. they That's correct. They, they cost a little more to treat. You know, so why can't we design a system that doesn't penalize them for that? Correct. I I mean, they carry the burden of giving birth to our civilization. Why can't we carry the burden of of making sure that their health care costs are not exorbitant? And you're absolutely right. And that's not a digression at all, because one of the things, one of the misnomers about your family and your uncle is that people, many, too many people think that your uncle and your family was just about promoting black people or making life right. better just for black people. That's and right. the truth of the matter is, it's not true. It was about making life better for everybody. Back to that community right. you were just talking about. Right. 
And, and, and that's, that's really what the message throughout that whole time was all about. And a lot of people got it confused and they thought it was about just, this is just an African American thing or this is just black right. thing. No, it was about right. making life better for, and I, I think that's why I'm so enamored and so connected with that whole message because that's kind of like the way I view things. Like, I don't understand why, why, why do we get caught up in all these colors and genders and yada, yada, yada. We're all human beings. That's it, Mark. And I, I feel a little sometimes a little self-conscious in saying it, but you know, because he was my uncle, and it it sounds you know self-serving a lot of you know. But he really did complete, you know, the work of the founding fathers. I, right. I mean, this was a this really was a great thing that those that, that those guys created way back then. Um. Um. And the only thing that, that they really didn't deal with, if you look at our Constitution, I mean, it, it really was a pretty amazing thing that they put together, but the only thing that they really, that they didn't deal with was the whole slavery thing. Right. Um, and, and they couldn't deal with it um, because of the ramifications of it. Um, but, but we really, truly couldn't be that America that they envisioned until we had the civil rights movement. That's correct. And and it wasn't like you said just about I mean we were the um the uh the the, the vehicle. Right. I mean we, we were the example but but as I tell people all the time I I I know not believe I know that had it been white people. Right. In the same boat in my right. own been black as a black preacher he right. would have given the same I have a dream speech. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it would have still needed to happen, and it completed, because it's been the basis of everything, and that's why it's so disappointing. And I really don't think that they really truly realize this is an example of a lot of white Americans suffering from that ignorance that I talked about Donald Trump. Suffering. That's correct. Uh, this whole thing about, you know, trying to gut or roll back or, or not the, the Voting Rights Act. Right. I mean, a lot of white Americans think that's a black law. Right. I encourage people all the time, read the law. It doesn't even talk about black and white. It doesn't even talk about race. Right. <laughs> it, it, it talks about majority versus a minority population. Right. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that before it got gutted uh, by the Supreme Court, or, or part, you know, part of it, and quite frankly, you know, they, they might have had a little bit of truth of what they were saying, um, but before it was gutted, Alaska was one of the states that, that was covered under the, the Voting Rights Act. Uh-huh. I mean, there are about two black people that live in Alaska. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, so, you know, but Alaska qualified because it was to protect right. the native Alaskans. Right. You know, we, we made Alaska a state, but, I mean, they were Alaska was, was existing, and, and the Alaskans were living there before they were part of America. And so... You know, to protect them, you know, Alaska was one of the states covered by the Voting Rights Act. Right. You know, a lot of white Americans don't realize it's got nothing to do with that, and the very thing that they're chopping down is the thing that's going to protect them moving forward because the demographics are changing. Correct. That is correct. And see, there again, a lot of these things <clears throat> that come down to racial lines that folks get to rallying about when push comes, when it, when the end comes, as you just said, they're impacted worse than we are. The very thing that they're trying to cut in in the name of that's benefiting the black people. Really, when you look at demographically and number wise, no, it's not. I mean, you take welfare for example. Right. You always get oh, my tax dollars. Like, no, no. If they cut that program out, do you understand how many Caucasian folks are going to be impacted oh, yeah. by that? That's yeah. the ignorance that you're talking about. I couldn't agree with you more. Right. Right. It's like yeah. we're saying these flippant statements and, and sound bites and everything, but the truth of the matter is your group is going to be impacted by that more than we are from a number perspective. Right, right. That was the only thing that I wish that, um, 
and he, I'm sure he didn't mean any harm, but that was the only thing I wish that, that uh, President Obama had, had done differently and that that others would, would do differently, you know, even when he signed Obamacare. All right. Um, you know, he was surrounded by, you know, black citizens. All right. Um, and that tends to happen a lot of times when they're signing some of these social things, and it gives the impression that it's... Exactly. You, you know, and, and white... <laughs> exactly, begin, yep. There are more whites benefiting than there are Correct. black. Correct. All of this stuff. That's, anything you name. That's right. Okay, from welfare to, to all of it. Yes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the stuff we do for kids, I can't think of the technical terms for it now, but... but but I'm saying all of that social stuff we do, there are more whites than blacks that are benefiting. Yes. And, and yet a lot of white Americans are walking around here, you know, not knowing that. Correct. And that was by design. Yes. Uh, um, you, 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 you know, but, but that paradigm is changing now. And, and that's, I, I mean, that's why, you, you know, we see some of the stuff that's, 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 that's happening a, a, around us. That is so true. For those of you in the listening audience, I hope you've been with us since 7 o'clock and 6 o'clock for that matter. I was on the air beginning at 6, but I certainly hope you've been with me at least since 7 because my guest this morning is Isaac Newton Farris Jr. His mom was Christine Farris, who was the sister. Is Christine, correct? Yes. yes. Who is the sister of Martin Luther King Jr. That makes Isaac Martin's nephew. He is a part of the King family. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have him on the show because I'm talking to someone who's, dir- even though he was a young, he, for the most part, Isaac and I are the same age. We're like four months apart. But even still, he still remembers Martin, the human side of Martin, because that was his uncle. As he said earlier in the hour, I just knew him as Uncle ML. <laughs> I don't know anything about the movement and all this, that, and the other. That was just Uncle ML. Came over, we had fun. He was the fun uncle. Right. Uh, and he had a heck of a sense of humor, I tell you. I've yeah. seen I've seen pictures of him laughing, like with Sammy Davis Jr. and Harry Belafonte, and I could just see from the picture that he loved to laugh. Yeah, and anyone who knew him uh, socially, I mean that, you, you know, quite frankly, people who knew my uncle um, knew liked ML uh, a lot better than they liked or respected Dr. King. Right, <laughs> I can imagine. Because, uh, <laughs> If you were fortunate enough to hang out with him, I right? Mean, he, he was a very down to earth, yes, guy. Uh, people definitely loved being around him, and that the one thing that people said about uh, my uncle is uh, he never uh, was, um, you know, he never was full of himself. Right. He never. He was always approachable. Uh, you you know around town. Right, uh, and and wherever he went, quite 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 frankly, but but I'm saying he he never had that that air about him that that gave you the impression that uh, you know you. you no, I, that, I know exactly what you're because you, uh, uh, th- look at it this way, Isaac. I mean, you're talking again during a time frame. There weren't that many African Americans that had obtained doctorate degrees, and certainly not doctorate degrees from Boston University. Okay, right. So the fact right. that you now you've obtained that, you've gone to Crozier, you've got your doctorate from Boston, you come right. back home or what have you to people that are for the most part uneducated for whatever reason, and yep. yet you're still able to relate and connect and touch them. That right. said, a whole. That's why I was saying earlier the fact that that. Cri- sits right there in open public on the street like that was the ultimate signification of how down earth he was. One of the books I was reading, because this is why I know he has a sense of humor, and any of us that go to church, you know, most of the time, the preachers sit either on the, you know, on the rostrum or the podium or the stage, whatever you want to call it in the church, up in the pulpit, they sit behind there. And there's a story in one of the books that I was reading how there was the preacher standing up in the pulpit and your uncle and another set of preachers was sitting behind him. And I guess the man must have flipped his shoes up from the back. You know how you're standing there and you yeah, flip your foot. Right. So they, the, the, the writer says that Martin saw that and now whispers to whoever he was sitting next to and says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, so those shoes have already come. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> 
that 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 yeah, that that was him. <laughs> See, and I always remember that story, and I laugh. And matter of fact, I'm conscious before I put my shoe up when I'm standing up somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> But I always remember, I said, see, because you never, like, if you're in this congregation, you see the preachers talking to each other, you have no idea what they might be whispering to each other back then. That's right. But (laughs) he's back then. (laughs) But that cracked me up. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, those shoes have already come. But yeah, true. I mean, but it is so important to be able to laugh and to be able to have a sense of humor, to laugh at yourself and what have you. And yeah. so whenever I come across those things about the, the sense of humor, and like I said, I've seen photos of him and Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, I don't know what Sammy said to him, but them two were rolling. They yeah. were cracking up. Yeah. Yeah. But it is important. And, and to be down to earth like that, I think was so important because I've again, the, I have I, t- I teach public speaking and. The I Have a Dream speech, we picked that speech apart <laughs> because, I mean, you could do a whole semester on that speech alone in terms of the literary devices, the figurative language, the liter- the, I mean, the things that are used in that speech. I mean, yeah. we could do a whole, whole lesson just yeah. on that speech alone, and we do. But, I mean, I just, like I said, for me, just to hear his voice, whenever I'm listening to anything, it just sends chill. I don't care how many times I've heard that I have a dream speech or the, the one on April 3rd or what have you. It does the it's same thing to me. It's a distinctive voice. It is. No question about it. Very much so. So, now, being a member of the King family, and I just, I just need to do the weather and all this stuff again, and then we'll we'll get down close to the end of another however many minutes we have left but before I'll, I'll give the question to you before I do the weather and all that stuff being a member of the King family does that put pressure on you in other words feel like hey well you know you're Dr. King's nephew what do you say about this what are you going to do about it what would he have done da, 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 da. do you get a lot of that think about that while I do the top of the hour and then we'll, sure. we'll roll on from there okay WPSC Wayne New Jersey 7 FM online. GoBrave.org, a tune-in radio station, part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. W-E-S-C. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is the innovative. I think they're really unique. The fearless. They have awesome variety. The kick-ass. I love Brave New Radio. The sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. Here's your North Jersey weather report. All right, 64.8 degrees. We're working our way up to a high of 78 with a low of 71 tonight. Tomorrow, Father's Day, 86 is a high, 73 is a low. Monday, 86 is a high, 66 as a low. Tuesday, 84 is a high, 63 is a low. And then on Wednesday, 81 as a high, 60 as a low. So look like we're going to do like this the 8060 thing throughout the week. Well, that is the weather brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. I gave you the abbreviated version because I want to get back to this interview. My guest is Isaac Newton Farris Jr. And as I said a couple of minutes ago, he's the nephew of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who like I said for me probably is the height if there is such a thing as hero. I mean, I I, I mean, I always tell people Isaac it's like Jesus, my father, and your uncle. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a good lineup. <laughs> and literally, that's kind of like my in true in terms of role models, in terms of how I kind of govern myself. And those are the three. Those are the, like, like I told you earlier. Whatever fraternity had I come, and I'm glad I didn't pledge anything prior to reading that, because I'd have been, I really would have been mad at myself. But. <laughs> Once I read that, that he was a member of Alpha Alpha Fraternity, that's when I made up my mind to pledge that fraternity. So I literally, people laugh at me when I say, I said, no, I'm serious. Whatever Martin was, that's what I'd have been. And, and, and so that's how much of an influence. But do you, as I said right before I gave the weather and the top of the hour, do, are you all pressured now? Kind of like, I mean, I'm like, there's like you, Dexter, MLK3, Bernice, uh, Alveda, all those of you who are left here, are you all pressured now to kind of like continue on the family, or, or do people look to you now to be the activists? Well, I, I think certainly they're, they're naturally uh, people look to us, but um, our parents and grandparents uh, did a very good job of essentially saying to us, 
you know, make your own choice. Right. Um, you know, they certainly uh, instilled in us a sense of of uh, giving back to the community uh, that nurtured our growth, but in our own way, choosing our way to do that. Uh, for instance, you know, in my family, um, for generations now, I mean, I guess if you had to say what what was the family business, or right. family profession, it, it would be the ministry. Right. But quite frankly, we were raised, distinctly that we could choose to do anything in life but that <laughs> no i'm serious oh, I, I, I understand we, we were told we couldn't choose to to go into the ministry right that we had to be called called that's right um and i'm serious about that that's I, right then you, you know my grandfather you know you know was proud of the fact and he talked about how his two sons followed him but he said i didn't Right. You know, uh, do that. I didn't make them follow me. I didn't tell them to. As a matter of fact, my uncle started out when he left um, uh, Morehouse, he was still thinking about the law. Right. Um, so, um, you, you know, we were told, you know, you, this is something, you, you know, you, you can't choose to do it. And in my generation, as a, as a um, reflection of the times, um, you know, there are more women um, who have um, gone into the ministry than right. men. Um, and who knows, maybe if times had been different, maybe my mother might have been a minister. Right. Um, but, um, you know, so I'm saying that to say that, that we were always told, look, you know, definitely always do the right thing. Correct. But you have the choice. Uh, as to how you do the right thing, or what vehicle you you know you you do that through, um, and so that they were always good about that, and and I think that's given us a sense of of uh, a sense of security, but also at the same time because um, there, it was kind of like a double whammy. You, you know, you had the the work of my uncle. Um, and then you you just had the work of the the family business, right. meaning there there was always uh, that sense of of uh, the, 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 the the doing the right thing from from the religious standpoint, and then also from the social responsibility standpoint. So, you know, to make a long story short, I think we all were raised with a sense of responsibility to be um, responsible and productive citizens. Right. How we did that was up to us. Absolutely. Uh, now, I know... And if that, if that was just, you know, holding down a job and, and, and raising, the, raising a family and making sure we voted and, you know, in all elections right. and paid our taxes... Right. Um, and, and, um, found a good church to be a member of, uh, that would be fine too. I know that's right. And again, that's going back to what your uncle said. If you're going to be the street sweeper, be the best street sweeper. Right. It's going, it's going, I mean, I, I was doing career day a couple weeks ago at, at, actually at my alma mater high school at Eastside high school. (laughs) And one of the young ladies asked me, she was a freshman. She said, Mr. Melody, you know, you think it was okay if I work in a Dunkin' Donuts and up here Dunkin' Donuts is a coffee? I don't know. I don't know if they have it down in Atlanta or not. But in, yeah, they do. They do. Okay, it is then I didn't know if they how far they reach, but I know Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. You think it would be all right if I work in a Dunkin'? I said, yeah. You go in there and you be the best coffee pouring donut serving exactly. thing in that place. That's right. And and so, <laughs> like you said, whatever you're going to do, do it well. Do it with excellence. Do your best at it. Do what's right. And, and and really, whatever you choose, do that. Now, a lot of times with your uncle, people think oh, all he talked about was love and peace and, and this and what. But the truth of the matter is, no, he started getting into the economics. He was trying to connect the dots between yeah. economics and, 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 and where you are, your lot in life. To be honest with you, Mark, I think that's what got him killed. It is. I know it is. Um. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it didn't, you, you, as he said, it didn't cost anything to to let you ride at the front of the bus. Right. 
I mean, that, that didn't cost anything. But if you start talking about wanting to own the bus company, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's You're another right. thing. Um, so, yeah, um, clearly he was. And then also I think what people need to understand, too, that's so important um, is nonviolence in his particular brand of nonviolence was not passive and it wasn't weak. Correct. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, um, misunderstand that. And um, I, I know that he would be happy with a lot of the stuff that's happening now, but he would also be sad right. about a lot of the stuff that's, that, that, that's happening now, particularly um, how he is seeing um, his, and, and here again, I, I I say this with a little, I, well, I say this with a lot of humility. Um, but but Mark, he really taught us right um, how to how, how to to fight and protest right in this country. That's correct. I mean, if you think about it, uh, the the civil rights movement set the model in this country. Prior to that, I mean, the, the only mass demonstrations that you saw that were similar uh, and similar, they were not alike, but, but, but um, the, the kind of resembled it were the, maybe the labor protests. Correct. Um, but those were, those were always pretty much violent. I mean, that was about brawl, right. basically. Um, but, but the nonviolent resistance and, and how we... How we do that successfully in this country uh, really was taught to us through the civil rights movement, and I know that he would be concerned to see how that's being abused. Correct. Uh, to, 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 today, I mean, I, first off, it's it's the you know it's the first move uh, when really, according to his methodology, it was the last move. If, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, we're quick now right. to kind of to, 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 to jump to the streets before, right. you, 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 you know, uh, we really do do the necessary homework. And I, and I know this will be controversial, and it has been when I wrote about it back during the time. Um, but I, the, the best example of what I'm talking about is what we saw happening in Ferguson, Missouri. Correct. I mean, with all due respect, it was unfortunate what happened with, with Mike Brown. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we will just truly never know, unfortunately, because there were no cameras. We'll truly right. Not know what truly happened there. I, I certainly think there was some foul play. But bottom line, um, you know, Ferguson is an embarrassment. I mean, this is a city that has a 67% black majority population. Right. Um, you know, people are there rioting and marching. Mark, they should have been holding mass voter registration drives. Yes. Um, I, I, I mean, bottom line, take responsibility. Yes. Um, if if you are, are, are just doing a simple thing, just want, you should do more. But if you do nothing but just show up. When you're supposed to every four years or every two, whatever you know the deal is. Yep. When municipal, when city elections are held, if you're participating, uh, I assure you, half, three fourths of those problems would not have existed. That's exactly right. Regardless, if you could have the same mayor that you got, because quite frankly, the time is over for voting for people that look like you. Right. Now the time to vote for people that think like you. Do. That's right. And, That's and, right. And quite frankly. Uh, politicians are, are the first to, to, to are the most responsive people, the most responsive animals and people on the planet. That's correct. If, if that white mayor, the same white mayor, had sixty seven percent of his black people showing up to vote, you can be assured he wouldn't be talking about we don't have a problem in Ferguson. <laughs> You're absolutely you know, right. You can be assured You're that he would have right. a police chief. Right. Would be, he, he, you know, you'd be sure he'd be saying, Chief, you can't be treating 67% of my voters like this, dude. Right. 
You're, I no, mean, you're you absolutely got to get right. Thrown out of office. I, I, I don't. Yeah, right. The Indians, whoever they are, dude, you got to treat them with respect <laughs> because these people are voting. That's absolutely okay? right. I will lose. You will. You will help cause me to lose my job. That's right. And before I do that, I will fire you. That's if you can't right. Listen, if you can't get your policemen treating these Indians or the black people, whoever they are, they're sixty-seven percent of the people that vote for me. Absolutely. We had our if primary. If people can't treat them right, I'll right. put somebody in here. Who will? Them. That's right. We had our primary a couple of weeks ago, and I got to the polls. At, cause I, vote, I don't care if it's for dog catcher, I vote. Thank I, you. I got there at 7.05, and the polls closed at 8. And I was numbered, because I looked at my ticket when they gave it to me, I was number 067. I said, this is yeah. ridiculous. And. Yeah. The police officer, when I said that, he says, oh, there are higher numbers in other polling places. I'm like, okay, I get that, but the number should be higher here. Right. Uh, but, but zero after, I mean, we're talking the polls is over from 6 o'clock that morning to 8 o'clock that night. Right. And this is That's for the right. primaries for governor and the assembly people and the state senate and all right. that kind of stuff. Yeah. I was zero. I was number 67. Right, and I said, "Wow!" As a matter of fact, I, I took a picture of it and I texted it to my pastor, and he was like, "This is ridiculous." I said, "Oh, it is." <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, <laughs> and, and I'm saying, you, you know, we showed up for, but even, even, and that was the thing about Ferguson. Even in 2008, man, in 2012, more white people in Ferguson voted. Uh huh. You, you know, uh-huh. and, and especially in 2008, I mean, black people were doing everything they could. To, to just be a part of history, but not in Ferguson. So, right. uh, y- y- you know, we've got to, one, we- we've got to, you know, step up and do the basics for ourselves. Right. Um, but also we've got to remember the, 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 the core principles, and, and that's part of what I, you know, I try to do um, is, is get people to really, you know, look back at, at Uncle and Mel. Um, yeah. And and really, just on unfortunately, the, the current generation um, of millennials, uh, Mark, they just you know in school we don't do the best job of of teaching uh, history. Period. Much right. Less I could not agree history. with you more. I could um, not agree. And with they you just more. see the clips. Right. You know what I'm saying? Of the marches, and I right. think they think that that's you, you know nobody is taking the time to say that by the time you saw the march. You know, a lot of things that happened prior to that. Correct. Um, my uncle never, never would say, even in this day of, even if he had social media, he would just never say, hey, sending out a tweet, let's just all show up at 3 o'clock <laughs> right. uh, at X place and, and raise hell. Right. I mean, he he would, his stuff was always organized. Right. They were always permitted. That's right. Um, you, you know, one, that permit process, it is dialogue within itself, you know, because you, you got to kind of lay out what you're doing and, Correct. And, and this, that, and the other. So that's a little dialogue between you and, and the government. But also what it does is that when, when people look around and see a 1,000 people, you know, and call in the police department, hey, you know, what what's going on? Well, yes, we're aware, uh, you know, there are going to be some people there marching. Police don't show up in riot gear. Right. They, they know what's what's happening. Um, there's just a lot of little steps in there that I think people don't, don't, you know, realize. I could not um, agree with you more. And, and that it, is it why we get what a we're lot getting. of unneeded. Things. Yes. That's so I said. That's why we're getting what we're getting. And I don't know if you noticed know one of the, the posts I have at my site, Isaac Newton for, for your listeners out there, um, is, um, a post which really, you know, a lot of people, some people kind of initially were upset about, uh, but a, a post entitled Political Violence Started on the Left, which I think it, it did, at least for this current cycle. Uh-huh. Um, because if you think back, if you think back, um, at Black Lives Matter, which I wholeheartedly support, I just, um, I of one or two of their tactics I, I have issues with. But other than that, I'm down with Black Lives Matter. Uh, it is the, the modern-day equivalent of, 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 of the movement. But they're doing some things that are not just not quite right. Right. As a matter of uh, fact, I'm looking at that post now, October 27th, 2016. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if you if you remember, it, it started in this cycle where you had Black Lives Matter showing up first at Bernie Sanders, right? Hillary Clinton rallies, right? And literally, Mark getting on the stage in front of the speakers and stopping them from speaking. Right. I mean, they weren't outside protesting. <laughs> they weren't inside maybe holding up a sign. They were literally jumping up on the stage, stopping them from speaking to their audience. That's right. Matter of fact, I'm looking at the picture you have on there now with Bernie Sanders. He had to leave that the stage. That is violence. Right, right. That's violence. Right. I mean, one thing my uncle talked about is Violence is just not merely hitting somebody. There's violence in the language that you use. There's that's right. violence in some of the things that we do. That is violence. When somebody, that's like somebody showing up at your house and taking over your house. Right. Oh, okay. And saying, <laughs> we're not going to let you eat at your dining room table. Right. Uh, that, that's uh, right. I mean, so what happened now, you, you know, they were a little more, they were hostile. They accepted it, bottom line, which might have fed the beast, so to speak. Right. And see, so I like that. people are looking at this. Right. right? I'm, I'm saying this was, it made the media, it, it, and the media played it up, right? That's correct. Trump's people were looking at, and like everybody was looking at it, saying, gee, now that's kind of not right. How can you show up at somebody's house or, or at somebody's event? And and literally jump on stage and stop them from speaking to people that they've invited there to to hear them speak. Right? How can this happen? We got something for them. And that's what <laughs> that's absolutely right. Black Lives showed up. That's Trump, right. Trump rally in Alabama and got beat up. Yep. Nope. You're right. And see, it escalated, I'll, and and it's been going downhill ever since. Is what I'm trying to say. And and that's and the fact that see, I, I know you were saying it's, it's somewhat controversial, but honestly, I think our posts in these blogs ought to be a little controversial, because it ought to get people to think. That's why my blog is called The Critical Thinker. I I want folks to kind of look at something from a different perspective. So you're absolutely right. I hadn't until you just said that, and now I'm going through the post. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I really do, and I'm not trying, and I don't say that trying to put because I'm supportive. I am too of, of what Black Lives Matter is doing, but I, I'm saying they misused the tactic there, right? And and it and it it escalated, and I think it's got us to where we are now. Is is, is what I'm trying to. An interesting observation again, and like well, I said, politically, at, 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 mm-hmm. at least, um, I'm not trying to say it, it's responsible for what happened to the congressman right but i am talking about the campaigning this is the first time that we've seen violence in presidential campaigns mm-hmm. this year. no and i i think it started with mm-hmm. my my kindred spirits the the black lives matter that i mean but no i don't think they, they they certainly didn't intend for this right but to, to happen but 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 it did and i think it's also because of a misread of history before, right. before you, you know, like I said, for for my uncle, the the demonstrations was like the A bomb. You know, there were right. other things done first, but even if you don't want to try to do the dialogue, you, you know, there's still a way to do things. Um, if you've got a permitted march, they got to let you have the march. Right. If you just show up somewhere, you're giving them an invitation to shut you down. Correct. But because I, I mean, you, you, you know, you just can't. And then the other things, doing things like shutting down a bridge um, over, you, you know, you know, like in New York, what they were doing. I mean, over the the, the guy that, that they choked to death. Right. Which was wrong. Right. But why are you going to go into Macy's and and stop innocent shoppers from shopping? Right. All you're doing is, right. is making people mad at your car. Right. You know, as opposed to being down at the fire at the police station, blocking that traffic, right. blocking people from being able to get into the police station. You know, people looking at that and saying, "Okay, well, I understand that. You know, y'all choked a man to death. Right. You know, y'all should be going through some stuff." But they're not going to understand why people in Macy's. And Macy's, that's, I, you're right. Okay, because the police <laughs> choke somebody, or why I can't get across the Brooklyn Bridge because, you know, you shut it down because the police choke somebody. <laughs> right. I, I'm saying it'd be different if, you know, we had a referendum and New York said, 
we vote to support the police choking somebody. Right. Then you go to tactics like the, but you 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 know you, you want to build support. You don't want to make people mad at you. Right. Is, is what I'm trying to say. You you want to you know make people sympathetic and want to hear your case. Right. You know, and shutting down Macy's or, or blocking a bridge where people are trying to get home after work who worked all day, who have, who who believed, who thought, thought the police were wrong, you now have made mad at you and, and think you're like some... Yeah, and you, know, you deserved it. You see, this is why the police choke you, because this is how you act. Right, that, right, that, 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 right, right, that, right. That's right, exactly right. right. I, I, I'm saying so... You, you know, and so I just think that, that we've got to get back to some really uh, educating people on really how stuff went down. Yes. And, and the tactics behind yes. what, what my uncle was doing, it just wasn't emotional. Right. You, you, you know, and, and his nonviolence was not about letting somebody beat you up and being a weakling. Right. You, you know, this was strategic. Right. Okay, my uncle would be the first to tell you if somebody's attacking, you run. Right. <laughs> Protect yourself. He, he's not dead. You know, or, or defend yourself. Or right. defend yourself. I, I'm saying that's not what his nonviolence was about. And, right. And, and, and people were doing that as a tactic. I mean, they were chose choosing. To, oh, you're absolutely right. Because, again. To be- take that, but, but not because they were weak, but right. because they were strong. That, you're right. Uh, that- uh, I, I, I mean, and, and like I said, if they were just somewhere out on the street and somebody right. attacked them, my uncle would be the first to say, defend yourself. Or right. run and do what you got to do. But, see, but they were chosen. To you're absolutely to right. It. And, again, because. I, I mean, this isn't about weakness. And that's and right. You want to defend yourself. That's right. And it takes more courage not to, because I tell kids this all the time in my school, the easiest thing for you to do is hit back. That's easy. It takes more courage to stand there and not hit back knowing you want to. And and going back to your strategic, and again, because I've studied it, I know a lot of these things that maybe people who haven't studied it don't know. But even when they did the whole thing with the kids, all that was orchestrated. Right. That wasn't just a matter of the kids took off a day from school and did that. Right. That was... They sat down, Wyatt T. Walker, your uncle, and all these folks. Right. That was, they were orchestrated events. Yes. And it did exactly what it was designed to do. That's why I, you're, you're right on point. Make no mistake, listening yeah. audience, Isaac is right on point. Yeah. And, and you know, I speak to a lot of kids purposely uh, because they're, they're our next generation, and I always tell them, please go back. Right. Look at what happened. In Birmingham, right? I mean, those were kids your age. Yes, who went to jail then? Who got beat up? You know, who got water holes yep. and all things. You don't have to do that now, right? You, you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, unfortunately, we got some of y'all going to jail now for the wrong reason. Absolutely, I, I mean, absolutely. We don't need y'all to go to jail no more. We need y'all going to school. I know that's right. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, I, I mean, it's so easy, you know. Your contribution is so easy now. Right. You know, but right. look at what, and, and I think a lot of them are, are, are really kind of surprised um, when you put it to them like that. Right. No, you, man, I'm telling you, I deal with kids every day. One, you're right. We don't do justice to this. I mean, they know the name, but they really don't know what it was all about. Right. Um, when they come in, my my office is like a little museum. People walk in there. I mean, there's pictures of your uncle all over the place. I got him, Frederick Douglass, Colin Powell. I mean, it's just Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Um, you got, I mean, Mandela. I mean, when you walk in my, it's kind of like a little black history museum when you walk in my office. <laughs> okay. okay. And it, but, but I use it for... I tell people that's those are my teachable moments. When a kid gets sent to my office, that's the kind of conversations we have. And so a lot of times I'll ask the kid, all right, kid, which one do you want? Do you want the sermon or the suspension? If the, if, <laughs> okay. the, if the kid is smart, he'll say the sermon. Like, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, 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 right. so we go into teaching at that point. Right. But, I mean, it is it is so important that we continue the message. Um, I have some of my Jewish friends. As a matter of fact, I was talking about this the other day, and I asked her, I said, in in in, in with Jews, you all let your kids know, you know, around birth or as they come up, your mantra of never again. And she said, that's right. We need to start doing those same things. Yeah. 
we need to start indoctrinating and educating and teaching our children. Look, this is why we did what we did. This is how we cannot go back. This is like you just said, intentional. The intentions of the movement, Black Lives Matter, you're, is on point. But the tactics is what's throwing it off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at look at the, the ground. Unfortunately, that's been lost. Right. Because of the tactics. Right. I mean, they started out with the nation captured, and you know, circumstances really have given them uh, all the ammunition that they needed. I mean, with the technology and, and all of these cops being busted doing right. all things. Uh, um, listen, th- this argument could be much further down the road, except for the, the distraction of the violence right. that's taking place. That's correct. There was one other thing we said, uh, and this this would we could talk all day on this. And this is actually where me and Dr. Pepper's paths crossed, because you were saying earlier we were talking about Dr. King in terms of him actually speaking about the economics. And you said that's personally what I think got him killed. I do too. It was that and the whole speaking out now against the Vietnam War, because I tell people all the time you need to understand there's money in war. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I personally, I. I, right. I think all I think JFK, your uncle, RFK, I think all of them lost their lives over Vietnam and Hell the yeah. economics of it. That's right. Because and that's where me and, and when I was reading William Pepper's book, I was like, yes, I thought I know I'm not crazy. But I've always said, I said, Dr. King lost his life over that war. Whenever you know, yeah. it, it was a year to the date when he spoke out against Vietnam that he got assassinated. It's over. It's over. Right. And, and again, parallel wise, I, this is what I tell you. I, I parallel it to the Bible. If you look at the Bible, when Jesus came in and he turned all those tables over and he started calling them vipers and snakes and so forth and so on, because you're not doing what you're supposed to do in my father's house. The money changed and this thing. That's when they all got together and said, oh, he got to go. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's right. There's one thing to be out there talking about the principles. That's right. And and love Jesus. But when you start messing with the money, right. That's exactly right. I, I'm saying you, you listen. What, what was one of the first things? What is one of the first things Donald Trump is doing right now? Right. He goes over to the Middle East and does what? Right. That's big that, right. arms deals. Yep. Okay. Um, it's the money, man. Yes, it money is. Will always be the money. Unfortunately. Yes, and, it uh, is. And he stopped. You know, at, at civil rights, he'd probably be with us today. That's right. Frankly. That's but, right. But you hit the dead on the nail, and the the war wasn't about, you know, communism versus the No. Democracy. It was about the money. Yes, it was. And the all money. of them since, the all of money. them, period, has been. But certainly those right. since have been. That's right. Uh, but, That's exactly right. But no. um, and, and we see it playing out now. I'm, I'm seeing one, one thing here again. Uh, and I consider myself to be politically an independent. I'm not right. I hear myself. you. Uh, my grandfather, I can hear him today, vote the man, not the party. Right. Um, so I've always been, you know, that's always been a seed there. Um, but I, I do appreciate what, um, you know, Barack tried to do in, in changing the paradigm, in, like in the Middle East. Right. I mean, essentially, he was like, look, we're going to flip the script. You know, we'll get we'll we'll give you all the weapons you need. We'll use all the technology, the drones. I'll I'll you know bomb the hell out of people. Right. But I'm not sending any of our, our boys and girls anymore. Right. Y'all gonna have to die. We, we'll arm you. <laughs> right. You, you know, we'll support you. We'll, right. we'll give you. Um. And 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 we we we'll pay. I right. Mean, before at least uh you know Bush's father with the first Gulf War said okay you know. We'll send everything, and you pay for it. Right. And it's either been over the years, the paradigm has been, you know, sometimes they pay, but, but you, you know, we were the ones dying. Right. Okay, all through it. And Barack said, hey, well, wait a minute, especially now that we got fracking in this country. Uh-huh. I mean, we, we got an energy source now for the next hundred years. We really don't need the oil from the Middle East. Right. Why? Why the hell should I be sending my boys and right. guys, girls over there to die now? I mean, we understand the rest of the world needs the oil, and so we'll do. We'll keep it. We'll keep the region stable. You, you know. Right. So that's why we'll do what we can to keep you know, some wars from happening over there. 
But in terms of us going over there and dying, right? That's why right. should we? That's right. You know, but now Trump is kind of flipping that back. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's another one of the things. You know, you're right. I see where I'm. I'm see where now he's he's leaving it up to the military mm-hmm. to to do what what you know to determine what we do over there. And and they're good people, but they are military people, and always their first thing is you know let's kick butt. Right. So we'll see how that that plays out, but you know. Um, just all all around, Mark, politically, uh, social social activism wise, uh, religion wise, right. uh, economic policy wise, we really need to. Uh, this country really needs to 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 take a probably for the first time. A real deep dive in, into uh, kingy and nonviolence. I, I could not agree more. Um, and it has, like I said, it, it's just not limited to to demonstration. Correct. It's certainly, just not limited to physical uh, violence. It's 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 the whole kit and caboodle. It, you are so right, and I tell you, we're down to the end, and what I do at that point is I shut the mic off in a couple of minutes and let you promote and, I mean, any books or your blog, anywhere you're going to be, how folks can get in touch with you to speak or what have you, you get a chance to do that. But before I do that, I will say this. I live in the city that was one of the last stops of your uncle before he went to Memphis. I think he was in Patterson because one of his friends here in the Patterson area that was a part of the movement was uh, is that Patterson, New Jersey? Yes. Uh, yeah. One yeah. of his friends was Fred Lagarde. Yeah, also an alpha man, one of my fraternity brothers, but uh, Fred Lagarde Jr., I believe. Fred Lagarde Sr. Jr., because it was three of them, so he must be Jr. But anyway, those two were friends, and he came to Patterson to speak at uh, Reverend Lagarde's church, and that was one of the last stops prior to going to Memphis. And and they have they have pictures of that event in that church in that particular church, Community Baptist Church, it was called at the time. And I think it's still called it. You just moved the location. But matter of fact, they've they've named that particular church sits oddly enough on Auburn Street in Patterson. Oh, OK. And um, they've renamed it to something I forget. And then what used to be Broadway in Patterson is Martin Luther King Way, which crosses what used to be Graham Ave, which is now Rosa Parks Way. And so Martin Luther King Way, Rosa Parks Way, they cross each other. And uh, Reverend Lagarde was a big instigator of that. Matter of fact, I think he was the one that that, uh, went to city legislation and made it happen. But I always remember, I said, wow, Patterson, New Jersey was one of the last stops of Dr. King prior to the assassination. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn. And I don't know how many in the listening audience, if you knew that or not, but yes, that's one of, that was like maybe a week, week or two prior to him going back to Memphis. Yeah. So uh, Isaac, it has been an absolute blast to speak with you. You're down to earth as well. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had, I don't know if you remember the show Good Times. I do. The, the young lady that played Thelma. Uh, Bernadette yeah. Stannis, she was my guest on it, and people kept calling me and said, I can't believe how down to earth she was. And I feel the same way with you. It's like, I can't believe he, yeah, he's down to earth as well. <laughs> um, so I thank you for that. I thank you for joining this morning. The chat has been wonderful. Listening audience, I hope you've learned some things as we've been talking. And I'm going to give Isaac the opportunity now. Like I said, you can promote and anything. The only thing you can't say is a dollar amount, but anything else, the mic is yours. Oh, no. I, I don't uh, just would like to say. For any of the listening audience that uh, would like to connect with me, uh, you can reach me through IsaacNewtonFarris.com. Uh, please come and and uh, reach out. Um, let me hear from you. That's how I learn, and uh, would also like to impart some a little wisdom to you. And uh, it's through experiences like this. And Mark, I want us to continue to be in touch with oh them. definitely show but 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 just uh individually because um i've been checking out the, the, the reading circle and uh you certainly are a source of both inspiration and information uh, well thank you and and so i i certainly want to to be a part of your orbit as well um and just continue doing the work that you're doing my brother uh, well 
Thank you. I'm gonna say the same to you because, like I said, for me, and like I said, I don't, I don't get starstruck. I really don't. I mean, it's not like I'm not like one because I've met celebrities, I met athletes, I met, and usually you shake hands and talk whatever, like and appreciate your work, enjoy your work. But anytime I start talking to like direct lines to Dr. King, I'm like in awe. <laughs> so the fact that we've been talking almost two hours now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it, it has been, it has been real, man, and and, and it's been good and. Um, look forward to us, you know, getting together, and and uh, I'm going to be reaching out to you because I I think there are a few programming ideas. All right, we can probably work together on that'll work. That that it's works really for about me. Getting the message out, man. Oh, getting the word out. I know that's right. And uh, as I said, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. Right. I'm I'm just uh, a Black American citizen. Uh, happy to be in this country. Happy to um, be be familiar with with King and nonviolence, right. and uh, I kind of want to spread that out there. Uh, not just it's not just about the man, right? Um, but but it's 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 about um, creating a better better world for us all to, to live in. We're so blessed here in this country. Right. Well, I tell you, because I am such a major believer in that philosophy, as a matter of fact, for me, it's a way of life as well. I'm more than willing to help you do that. So we'll definitely connect to see how we can further that, whether it's through our writings or radio or appearances or whatever. Look forward to it, my brother. Same Thanks here. For having me. Thank you for joining me, and I wish nothing but the best to you and yours. Tell everyone I said hello, and you all keep doing what you're doing as well. We'll do it, Mark. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. All right. Wow. (laughs) That's all I could say is.